water. Calming, relaxing. Challenges to keep it balanced. Definition of water from Wikipedia is, water is a transparent fluid, forms the world's streams, lakes, and oceans, and rain, and is the major constituent of fluids in living things. Surface water and drinking water, both areas that I'm involved with and, and have spent my whole career helping to develop. I want to discuss with you some of my experiences I've had helping communities, helping build strong communities as it relates to water. I'm going to break it into three parts. Decision makers, rules and regulations, and political boundaries. Each of them create a unique challenge as we develop water projects. Water conflicts. Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. So I'm going to challenge you to figure out who said that. Whose quote is it? Who are, where do conflicts come from? Neighbors, whether it's a neighboring community, neighboring landowners, upstream, downstream interests, very, very challenging as we develop water projects. Rural urban, another common water conflict that we need to deal with as we develop water projects. Many times as we develop water projects in, in the area of flood control, the question gets asked, who caused the flood? And I like to approach it from, what caused the flood? Flooding, too much water. It comes from rain, too much rain, too much snow, or both. And it creates people's fear. Will it damage my property? Will it get destroyed? Will I have a place to go tomorrow? Can I afford the solution? Might I have to evacuate? All kinds of fear that comes with people during floods. Droughts. I'd like to know what this gentleman was thinking when he took this picture. The 1930s, a very severe drought throughout the United States, and the valley was, was no different. Again, the fears. Will I have water to drink? Will there be water for food? And Again, the imbalance of water, and we try to keep it balanced. The water cycles are cyclical. Droughts come and go, floods come and go. But they always come back, and so we need to balance the extremes. And how do you do that? Sometimes wonder, is it, are, the, are the cycles connected with global warming? Well, I, I think global warming is cyclical also. And with global warming comes changes of water cycles. Most people only understand what they've learned from an extreme event. And it's sometimes hard for them to understand what might happen in a more extreme event. And that's one of the, one of the challenges that we have as we develop water projects to try to understand what, what could happen that's worse than what you've already experienced. So I'm going to use some maps and some charts, as engineers do, and try to make a few points. This map is the average annual precipitation over a 30-year period throughout the United States. Green is wetter, and the dark colors are drier. What I do know is those colors change through time in all the regions. Where we're at, in the Red River Valley, yellow and gold on this map, sometimes it's green, Sometimes it's orange, creating the extremes that we need to work around. So decision makers, who are they? Decision makers can be elected officials. They can be city or county officials, legislators, Congress, the President of the United States, directors of engineering. They're all decision makers. In addition to decision makers that are elected, we have uh, agency directors, people who sign permits, people who sign records of decisions. They all have a factor in projects being advanced. And the last group is citizens. We all have input. We all become part of the decision-making process as projects are developed. 
Many times, the challenge with projects is to determine who is the decision maker, or in some cases, who are the decision makers, where multiple people have to make decisions. Rules and regulations. NEPA is a rule. It's an act that was passed in 1969, and it created an environment where decision makers are required to know what the impact of the environment is before they do an action. An action could be developing a project, funding a project, or even giving permission to somebody else to build a project. Prior to NEPA, the conflict of water projects was generally worked out in the field during construction. Many times decisions were made in a smaller, in a smaller setting, public didn't get a chance to participate, and so you found out about the project while it was being built. Post-NEPA requires all those conversations happen through a decision-making document so the public is aware and the decision-maker is aware of the effect on the environment. I think it's a very legitimate process. With NEPA comes multiple other laws and rules and regulations that need to apply. Political boundaries. Water comes on watersheds. States, state boundaries, city boundaries, county boundaries, national boundaries, they conflict. They're different and it creates challenges. So I want to bring it to the Red River Valley. We have watersheds. Watersheds are managed at the county level. In North Dakota, Minnesota, they're managed at the watershed level. They both work, they're different, but they both work. And they have the opportunity to work with each other where they want to, and many do. The Red River Valley, most of us think it's flat. Okay, it's not. The Red River Valley is like a trough. The bottom of it is very flat. The sides are very steep. And with that comes water into the bottom of the valley very fast, and therefore, and, and the Red River is very slow in taking it out. So it's fast in, slow out, therefore we have flooding. Every color change on this map is 100 feet of grade of elevation change. So you can see north to south, a couple hundred feet, two to three. East to west, there's hundreds of feet. So the water gets to the bottom of the valley fast and has a hard time getting out. <clears throat> so what are we doing in the valley about flooding? Okay. Uh, Normally when we look to flood control, we look at three types of projects. Ditch it, damn it, dike it. Okay? Or do nothing. And I'm gonna approach this as do nothing is not an alternative for flood control. Okay? What's on the Red River Valley today? On the Red River main stem, we've got, uh, we've got the White Rock Dam, south of Wapaton. Wapaton has a diversion. Otter Tail River goes around Wapaton, Breckenridge, and they have dikes and, and levees. Fargo, I'll come back to that. <laughs> Grand Forks has levees and a small diversion channel. Wap or Winnipeg has a huge diversion channel and levees. So there's a multitude of things, but generally it all comes back to ditch it, dam it, or dike it. And one of those three, or a combination of those things, normally get it worked out. So back to Fargo. We're developing, Fargo Moorhead's developing a flood control project. Not without controversy. We have political problems. We've got regulatory problems. We've got funding challenges. All of them create the conflict that you're seeing every day when you open the paper, just about every day. There's very, quite a bit of activity going on right now. So it, it just creates the environment of conflict and we need to deal with it. Uh, the regulatory process requires that a lot of time goes by, a lot of conversation gets held, and sometimes that's okay. You work out the differences, you figure out the solution before you build it. And I'm convinced we'll get there. Uh, and uh, the decision maker right now for part of that is actually in court. So it's another decision maker that I hadn't brought forward before. On the, on the drought side, uh, if you know, the, the Missouri River is in another watershed. So in addition to our political boundary challenges, we've also got a watershed boundary challenge. The solution to the drought 
in the valley, or to, to water supply in the valley is bringing Missouri River water in. That plan was discerned in 1944 by the Pick Sloan plan. It was started to be constructed, the dams got built on the Missouri River, the diversion channels started to bring water from the Missouri River to the Red River, and the NEPA process shut it down through, through the conversations and all that, that went on with the NEPA project, or with the, with the developing of the project, the, that plan is now dramatically different. It is now the Lake Agassiz water supply. Uh, originally, Garrison Diversion was gonna bring irrigation to the valley, and now the plan is to bring drinking water to the valley. Again, very controversial, very time consuming. That particular project is now in its 70th some year. I believe weather patterns are cyclical and the history will repeat itself. So if anybody thinks there will not be a drought in the valley, you're kidding yourself. And if anybody thinks there will not be another flood in the valley, you're kidding yourself. They will happen if we don't do something soon in Fargo, in Moorhead, we're gonna have the Grand Forks model, which is unfortunately you gotta destroy the community before you rebuild flood control. I applaud the decision makers in the valley for, in Fargo-Moorhead for trying to get ahead of the destruction, to try to get the project built before we have to spend all the money twice. So back to the original question. Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Who said it? Most people think it was Mark Twain back in the mid 1980 or 1800s as the United States was being developed. Well, some of you know that I recently bought a barrel of whiskey <laughs> at an auction one night for NDSU, so I'm convinced Jack Daniels coined it <laughs> as he rolled out his first barrel on a marketing ploy. Thank you. <laughs>